And by being a server, you are racing with other people. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. I race designed to win. It's time for negative camber. Down the inside, Hamilton sees it coming. It's a late lunch by Verstappen, who takes the lead of the race. If it's motorsport you want, then this is the place to be. All of the latest results, analysis and interviews. And a great start for car number 11. Delberto's got away beautifully at the start of the great race. Right now on Radio Italia Uno 87.6. And now it's time to introduce your hosts, Jamie Lemure and Lee Harrison. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another show of Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly supporting the Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide. I'm your host, Jamie Lemura. Hope everyone is well and you've all had a good couple of weeks since we last spoke. Um, we're about to shoot over to Miami to uh, catch up with my good friend. But before we do that, we need to roll out the intro. So hit it, Ron. So appropriate. The Lord himself, Mr. Lee Harrison. How are you, my friend? How are you, buddy? Yeah, good. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Um, I hope you enjoy your new theme music. I uh, Star Wars was just too upbeat for me, uh, whereas you know Darth Vader's intro is probably more more resonant with you. I think. Well, I'm a king of the Dark Lord, am I? Well, you may as well be. <laughs> you got the black jacket <laughs> on at the moment, so you're halfway there. So what's going on, in Miami, mate? The clock is ticking. We've got what three weeks until till race week. No, um, unfortunately, I wish you were correct and we had three weeks. We are T-minus two weeks now to race day. Um, and in fact, by uh, the, this time in one fortnight, uh, I'll pretty well be getting ready to um, to start the day almost with uh, with race day. So, yeah, it's uh, it's coming quick. Um, another, another fortnight to go. So, yeah, it's going to be here before we know it. Yeah, it looks pretty exciting. Some of the photos that you sent to me uh, personally over the last couple of days, that the facility is just looking really, really schmick now. Um, but I'm like, you know, with the, the yachts and all that sort of stuff and all that infrastructure in place. But um, yeah, just uh, give our listeners a bit of a bit more of an insight in terms of what's been happening and where you guys are at in terms of infrastructure and that sort of thing. Yeah, it's like it's getting pretty close. Um, like you saw in the photos, the the yachts have moved into the marina and the build around the decking and stuff has started for the water and um, the walls are mostly in. The Marshall Point debris fence is mostly in. Um, sports signage are here. They're doing all of the signage now around the track, so the banners for in the braking markers are, are in the braking zones and, and the backdrops are, are going in and the bridges are going in and. Yeah, it's uh, all the pit lane stuff's going in. Our freight starts to arrive on Monday, um, so tomorrow. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And then uh, all of the team stuff should start arriving sort of Wednesday, Thursday. The cars will then come um, basically from Imola to us, uh, arriving Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and uh, then it's all all action go. Um, so yeah, it's... It's coming along nicely. The the rest of the corporate infrastructure, let's call it, with the, the villas and the paddock club and um, all of the terraces that are around the place are, are going in. The, the podium started today as well. So still lots happening. It's been an absolute madhouse out on site. Um, I've been bumping in a whole bunch of pallets and stuff on the forklift and it's almost like, you know, you've got to fight for your spot. <laughs> First lap of a Grand Prix on the forklifts at the moment. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy stuff. Oh man, but um, oh, some of the infrastructure there in, in terms of even like race control and stuff like that, I mean, you can clearly tell no expense spared. Um, just really, really super impressive. Like it's it's going to look amazing once it's all finally sort of kitted out properly. I hope that the um, broadcast does it justice, to be honest, like just rocking up every day and seeing how far along everything comes and how much it changes um, day to day is is mind boggling um it's good there's you know good team of people everything's all the jobs are getting done and everyone knows their path so it's um it's been good to uh to be part of that 
but yeah, the race control definitely with all the um, creative work on the outside of that, the entry to the paddock clubs going in as uh, sorry, the paddocks going in as well. So that's got a pretty cool little entryway, which I'm sure I'll uh, be able to get a photo of this coming week. But uh, yeah, it's it's pretty cool. No, like you said, no expense spared. Um, driver's briefing room is going to be one of a kind as well. So I've had a big hand in helping create that um, experience for the drivers. And we've got some little gifts that we're going to give to the owners of the race afterwards, hopefully. Yeah, wow, that's that sounds pretty cool. Speaking of cool, um, I do believe Mr. Sergio Perez was at the track the other week doing some laps in the Red Bull. Were you there to witness that phenomenon? Uh, that was a long time ago, actually. That was well before I got here. So really, that's, um, yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, that's come up um, over Instagram um, from a from a little while ago. So if you have a have a close look at yeah. the video, he was actually on the track. But like well before they even put the final lift down on the on the racing surface and but yeah uh from the people that were at the venue when that activity took place they did say it was very very cool yeah wow i was gonna say because when you look at the video footage um because red bull had only released it and i think uh, whoever had put it out on instagram it's only literally just popped up this week and you look at the inboard and the first thing that you noticed was how slippery it was because it was literally, there was nothing there. It was just dust and, and you could see the circuit outline. And the impression that you got was just like, wow, if they've got two or three weeks left, there's a lot of work to do beforehand. But clearly when you sent the photos that you showed me last night, um, it was well in advance compared to what it was um, from when we saw it uh, on the video there. So, so I think that video uh, was kind of great. three I can't months ago, it. four months ago. Mm, mm, okay um fake water can you expand upon that because that got me by surprise when you talked about that last night i'm like how can you get fake water so for those listening at home spill the beans so they've, we've built well they've built the marina um out at the turn six seven eight uh, section which is where the boats are going to be docked they're actually on a dry dock so they're just sort of cradled in um the guys are in the process at the moment of building a scaffolding around the boats and then framing that scaffold in um, from the top. And then what's going to go over the top of the scaffold um, is like a, a pebble sequency style deal that's going to make it look like a rippling water effect and glistening water. So it's going to look pretty cool um, on, the, on the TV. It's going to look, uh, hopefully, the idea is that it looks like it, the boats are in a marina. Um, and yeah, it's going to be a pretty cool little party atmosphere out there. It's going to be yeah, some nice, nice boats out there. Yeah. Um, ticket sales, they talked about how that's all tracking at the moment. Have, have the people of Miami started to get behind the event? Uh, mate, there's no such thing here as get behind the event. It's um, been sold out. Every release that goes on sale is uh, snapped up in about 15 seconds flat. So um, yeah. And the wow. tickets are super expensive as well. Um, so it's been fully embraced. Um, We've had a few challenges the last couple of weeks with a, I'm sure everyone's, if you know, if you've been on, on the news at motorsport.com, um, we've had a few uh, problems with a, a group of residents from the city of Miami gardens that have been trying to oppose the race, but that's all sorted now. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been fully embraced otherwise. You sure they're not representing the Adelaide city council? Well, I mean, maybe. <laughs> I digress. Um, just off topic, um, I guess, well, not really off topic. It's something that's close home to you. I actually went past Aussie Carts during the week and caught up with uh, Armando and had a check out of the facility, as you know. Um, really cool piece of kit. Good fun. Um, if if those that are, have yet to visit the facility and you want to feel what it's like driving in the wet in a very much controlled environment where it's bone dry, come to Aussie Carts. Um, it is great, great fun. And, um, the guys have done a, a good job in your absence really. Um, and without your, uh, without your directorship so far. Um, so, but, um, I'm sure when you come back to Australia and, um, you, uh, you touch, touch base again with everyone there that you, uh, start to sort of weave your magic there and, and, and sharp and sharpen it all up too. But I uh, know it's a uh, credit man. It's been a good job. Absolutely. Yes, it's looking good, um, good to get that open in the last couple of weeks as well. So that's been, you know, in the background running while I've been over here and trying to help the guys out as much as I can from the other side of the world. But yeah, it's good to see that it's finally open and uh, being relatively well supported by the 
by the community. So, you know, if you're, if you're in the Holden Hill area or you want to say, try something different for you, if you're hire carding, it's the first electric hire carding venue. So, you know, indoor, no fumes, uh, less sound, more, more about the tire screeching than it is about the sound of a petrol engine. So um, yeah, it's something different to check out. Yeah. Um, and it was a lead into the next event that the Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide is holding, which is the Aussie Karts time trial exhibition event, which will be next Saturday from 12 to 2. So Radio Taliuno is actually going to be present there with uh, Mark Aston and David Heath with the Saturday afternoon sports show. So what the club had uh, initiated, and I had these discussions with Armando during the week, was uh, a little showpiece event where we just have 12, 12 spots available. Um, and there'll be two 10 minute sessions plus a burger and fries meal. And so it's for a hundred dollars. Uh, and it is open to the, the general public as well as good the Ferrari club members, but there are only 12 slots available. So, uh, tickets can be purchased on our website. So www.sfcadelaide.com drop onto the online store and just hit the link, register your details in there. And we have the entries, if you want to call it open to Thursday to allow time for catering and that sort of thing as well. So. The time trial exhibition is, it's basically a chance for um, 12 drivers to get out there and set their fastest lap. You've got uh, 10 laps or sorry, 10 minutes is about 20 laps. Um, and so by the time you finish the fastest lap out of the two sessions between all of the drivers, the, the winner will walk away with a little trophy for their efforts. And then you can kick back and, and sit on the, uh, in the first place uh, cafe and enjoy the, uh, wonderful American cheeseburger and fries meal. Um, so I uh, can't say I haven't actually had it yet, but I have seen it when I was there, there were people that were getting served with it and it looks amazing. So um, it's a good opportunity to get behind the club as well as get behind uh, Aussie carts. Um, so they've had some strong interest there. There's been people there pretty much every day flat out for the most part. So it's been a good start considering doors have only just opened on the carting side of things in the last week. Yeah, and I can vouch definitely for Stefano at uh, First Place Cafe. He does an amazing job, and those cheeseburgers are the bomb. Um, he does a good loaded fries as well. So uh, even the sandwiches that he does are, um, are nice. I'm not sure which ones he's decided to put on the menu just yet, but uh, none of them are, are bad. So, uh, yeah, it's good to hear that it's going well. Um, we can ramp it up for sure as we uh, head into the winter months, and uh, it's going to be a good place to uh, come and have a vibe. Um, in, in winter, nice warm coffees and uh, some go-karting never goes down badly on a sat soggy Saturday. Mm, exactly. And the uh, the uh, the espresso coffee went down a treat and the lovely double shot was just absolute perfection. Well done, lads. Um, speaking of perfection, the Ferrari Formula One team are currently hitting perfection with their F175 and that means it's a good opportunity to join the Scuderia Ferrari Club and capitalize on that momentum and express your Ferrari passion. However, if you are a motorsport aficionado, um, don't feel that you have to barrack for Team Red to be a part of this club. So uh, $85 will see uh, you become a member of the club. You then get the opportunity to, it opens the door to a whole lot of uh, activities and events. Um, you get to meet our, us two boneheads, but also um, you get an opportunity to participate in hire cart events um, you get an opportunity to do some social events as well with us through the club. You'll get merchandise discounts through the Ferrari store. You've got the ability to have Zoom events and actually meet the likes of Mattia Binotto and, and Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc um, on a regular basis. Um, but also you become part of a, of a motorsport family where we're probably the only club in South Australia that actually has a dedicated high, when I say the only club, any motorsport club um, that's quite local where we've actually got a dedicated structure that could lead you to anywhere. So when I say that, you can just choose to be a member and enjoy the Melbourne Formula One Grand Prix experience that we've done in the past, which will start to rebuild some momentum again. Um, if that's not your thing, you can just come out and do some socialising and come to some of our social events that we'll uh, raise later and do uh, over the course of the year. If you're a bit more of motor racing orientated and you want to have that experience, then you can actually jump on board and join the higher cart championship and either participate in that where you can race at Aussie carts or you can race at Jeps cross cart mania, for example, or you can race at the bend. Uh, but also from higher carts, you can actually make the transition into club karting. And from there, you can either join our team or you can be a member that can be part of say um, a support network, which includes the likes of Mr. Harrison over in Miami, 
uh, which does include uh, the likes of TD Racing and, and Craig Denton, Matt Hall as well. Um, you can get some um, some really good tutelage from the likes of um, JK Tuning and John Caravis and and uh, the Sprint Master crew, which you yourself have um, you know have helped roll out with Nick. But from there, you can actually race local uh, karting events, and we actually give you the opportunity, the support structure, to get up to speed very very quickly, and make that transition into um, into club karting, which is a different beast altogether so much more easy than what current clubs are doing at the moment where they pretty much give you the basic uh, onboarding process you purchase your own go-kart and you're more or less left to yourself and it can be a very very learning and intimidating world uh, if that's the case so um from club karting you can choose to go to and participate in races at the australian karting championship you can we've got a support network in place where it can lead on to bigger and better things as well so all it takes is eighty five dollars um, and so that's something that I, I, you, I highly encourage you to do, uh, and I'm sure Lee can vouch for it before we go on to our, uh, our first break, um, the experiences that he's had as a Scuderia Area Ferrari Club member. Yeah, of course. You know, like the first uh, paddock, one that uh, tour that I did outside of being working was with, uh, with you guys at Melbourne Grand Prix. So it's been good to be part of the club and race the high cart championship. It's got, you know, meant, meant something for my mum as well to be able to join the high karting uh, championship and get to race with me in the endurance races so it's been good family bonding but yeah like I said it's not just about Ferrari it's about motorsport it's about just sharing a passion for motorsport um, we obviously do have that Ferrari link but I'm not necessarily a Ferrari fan diehard through and through I'm a driver follower more than a, a car follower so I'm still part of the club and, and have fun and, and like you said you get that access as well if you do want to get into motorsport or you want to talk to people who have um, uh, an inside knowledge I suppose in in the motorsport industry and ask them all those questions that you want to you've always wanted to have answered uh, you, you have access to a wealth of knowledge um, and, and, and what for $85 it's, it's a pretty small price to pay. Exactly right. Uh, we're going to be off to a short break, but before we do, jump onto the website, www.sfcadelaide.com. Hit us up on the Facebook page or either Negative Camber as well as uh, the um, Scuderia Ferrari Club page. And uh, we'll be off to a break and we'll come back and we'll talk karting. You're listening to Negative Camber with Jamie and Lee on Radio Italia Uno 87.6 FM. Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly supporting Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide. I've got my host in Miami, Mr. Lee Harrison. Mate, I've got to say the uh, the hair is looking very impressive. That is that is Elvis-like, that quiff. That is, mate, sensational. Props to you. It's just, I'm it's jealous. just because I've it's just because Very I've jealous. had my uh, hairdress, my microphone or my hair headsets pulling my hair back. It's uh, I've had a cut today and it's fluffy because it's been washed. So uh, yeah, it's it's nice to have the, the long hair, but I've got my race day haircut, so I'm looking fly for uh, for F1. Mate, that is. I was looking at it before. I thought, my God, he's done the quiff. That is that is sensational. Look at it. What a buffont. Props it's to you, still, man. It's better than this. Still going to be my that nice. That's what I've got here. <laughs> it's still going to be my nice slick back <laughs> look with uh, nice curls for the for my ladies. <laughs> uh, phew, phew. I'm not going down that path, man. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife is my ladies. No, my so, ladies um, at home love my curls. So. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, good. Um, so we had a couple of. Um, we had a couple of questions and stuff like that before we came up to before we cover our carding segment very quickly. Um, firstly, uh, there has been some modifications to our YouTube channel. So um, I had um, some issues in regards to the account set up uh, probably a week or so ago. And so what I've had to do was restart a brand new negative camber YouTube channel. Um, so for those that did subscribe and support, I apologize. Um, I'll blame my boomer like um, internet skills for that. Uh, but we're back online with YouTube and uh, yes, you laugh, but it's the truth. I'm quite arcade T-Rex arms. So, um, <laughs> I'm quite prehistoric in that regard, but, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have our YouTube channel up and running again as of, uh, this week. So you can come back and watch the last episode, which was episode 25. And then, uh, all of our episodes will be regularly uploaded on that point there too. Um, 
the other thing that was uh, that was uh, brought up was um, people had made mention of the fact that I had left Tindo. I don't know why, but they did. So yes, I have left Tindo Solar. And uh, when people were alluding to the fact that Shay was my, your wife was going to be my manager. Yes, I've just recently joined uh, Intuit QuickBooks Australia. Um, so I will be working with Lee's wife, Shay, uh, moving forward, which is a really good opportunity though, in all honesty. So I had uh, five good years at Tindo. Uh, they were very, very good to me, very supportive of it. Um, we'll miss the place. Uh, but another opportunity beckons and uh, something that's uh, going to be quite prosperous, I feel too. So really looking forward to that starting in the middle of May. But um, yeah, thank you for, for your thoughts and your well wishes, crew. I much appreciate the support. Um, but we will go into our carding segment now. So the AKC. So round two of the Australian Carding Championship was held at the Southern Go-Kart Club, um, which was over the Easter long weekend. Massive field, massive field of about 320 entrants across all classes, which was last larger than last year's field. And to be fair, there were no COVID restrictions in this case now. So um, they had... Um, it, it was still that that sort of vibe when I went. I managed to go to the track uh, and see practice and qualifying on the Friday, so it was just a good opportunity to snoop around um, and um, and see what's out there and get get a feel for the place. Um, admittedly, it was actually a bit cooler temperature wise this time compared to what it was last year, which was great. So it was a lot more pleasant for a majority of the competitors there, um, and there was probably about four seasons in the space of the weekend. Uh, they even had a little bit of rain on the Sunday as well, which was uh, good to spice things up. So uh, biggest takeaway from the event um, was the fact that there were 12 rollovers over the course of the weekend, So, which was horrific in itself. Um, but also whilst the racing was close, there was probably a critique in the driving standard as well. Um, so having a chat with a few people during the week, uh, just to make sure that I was factually correct, a lot of those incidences in terms of the rollovers outside of a couple were in straight line situations. So when it's in a straight line situation, then the only person you can really blame or people that you can blame are the individuals that sit behind the visor. Uh, however, you've seen some footage during the week, mate, and um, there may have been another element that may have been contributing to those rollovers as well. Yeah, it looked like there was just um, a lot of grip. A lot of grip went down. I have not seen uh, there was a rollover in particular that you sent me um, by a video that was um, quite a quite a nasty one, and uh, it looked like the the driver in question just got into turn one a little bit deep and and slid the back in. And when they've turned in to try and make the apex, the the go kart just stood up on on the inside wheel, stood up on the outside wheels and carried him over. Which, I mean, when I, we know where that there's a lot grippier tyres this year and um, with that many carts on, on track the grip goes down and yeah just the way that he got it in the corner uh, went over over on his on his lid <clears throat> yeah it was pretty horrifying <clears throat> I want to say horrifying it was pretty um, it was really interesting to watch and horrifying just how easy it happened you know so he's, um, the driver in question has clipped the curb uh, going onto the inside to try and wash off some speed but the car's just dug in on the right side and just gone bloop straight over um and so easily as well well that was the, the big big takeaway from me was just how easy that happened a lot of lateral grip um especially in i think that was like it was x30 uh as well so lots of lateral grip soft tires driving it in deep and you know with that much grip on the track you're not slowing down a whole heap um you're still going through there at quite a rate of knots so if you if you do make contact with the curb and, and unload that inside of, of the go-kart it's if there's lateral grip on the outside that's um got enough force behind it it'll uh, it'll send you over it's it's used to be you know we used to call mm. it two-wheeling or bicycling um I, i've done it in the in the gillard in at the retro um days so just the way that you set the card up and and it will, it'll do it for you yeah, I was going to say, is there a way that you can actually get around it um, in terms of setup, or is it now a fundamental uh, aspect given the, the nature of the tyre itself? I mean, there's ways that you can make it more controllable, um, but the one that we've, uh, we're talking about is, you know, circumstantial. It's just the way that that person got into the corner, clipped the curve or whatever, and, and rolled over. You know, no one else, 11 other or 12 other people didn't do the exact same thing, so I'm not trying to say that there's a fundamental issue with what's going on it's just it's just circumstantial the grip coil has gone down the way that he got it in the corner on the 
like, uh, lateral load is, is what caused him to go over. But of course, you know, when we used to run on proper rubber tires and proper grip would go down like it does now in Europe, you don't see the guys um, flipping over every single corner. So it's just a, it's just the nature of the beast. And we're, we're racing now at higher speeds than we've ever raced before. Um, and, and unfortunately, braking distances are getting shorter and shorter uh, because of the grip through the corners. So now uh, moves are having to be made at um, more risky opportunities. And, and unfortunately, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have its consequences. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. I know the the new tire has definitely thrown the cat amongst the pigeons in regards to setup as well. There's still a lot of drivers, especially even at KZ2 level, uh, a lot of the established teams are still trying to get their head around it. Um, you know, even the Patrizzi course guys were, um, you know, bumping into having a chat with Troy Losco over the weekend as well. He was um, he was still working it out um, over the course of the weekend, and I mean, he he nailed qualifying and 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 pole position, but. What I noticed, especially coming out of the last corner, is that uh, a lot of the go kart, certain go kart brands, I don't know, and whether it's a setup thing or, or what have you, but um, in particular, what I noticed was the the Karting Republic chassis in comparison. So all three brands, which were the Alonso, the KR, and the WPK, so all more or less coming out of the Tom Williamson garage, their drive under acceleration was a lot, lot better than pretty much any other card out there. So they would grip up and they'd, and they'd put their power down a lot better coming out of the exit of the last corner going onto the front straight than pretty much any other card that was out there. So you'd see, um, you know, the, the Birrells, for example, would, would have really good turn in. So the cart would dig in on the front and actually grip up at the front. But then, they'd, <clears throat> pardon me, they'd struggle to actually put the power down a lot better and a lot cleaner, whereas the... Um, the Kart Republic carts were probably a lot more evenly balanced, but they were able to put full throttle on probably a good five or ten meters earlier than um, and drive out of the corner a lot better as well. Pardon me. <clears throat> yeah, just the way that the carts are built, you know, carts these days as well are starting to favour different circuits. We um, we've we've seen it before. You know, there's always a chassis that you want to be in. Tony carts for a while there, arrows for a while there. There's always been you know CRGs that you wanted to be in for a while there. Um, it seems that the car public carts are, are liking these conditions. Um, but yeah, we will see what happens at the next round as well, because it was not that same way in round one. The um, the car public carts and the WPK carts weren't dominating, so to speak. But uh, yeah, round three will round three will be the uh, the teller. Absolutely, um, it was actually nice to see a couple of different brands in the KZ class as well. Which was uh, there was a CRG in there. There was also a Tony card in there as well, which was good to see. Otherwise, it was um, you know normally your Parallels, your Burials, and then also your um, your Cart Republic carts that were more or less the dominant uh, of that field. So, let's run through the results. Uh, we will start with. So, what I've done, I was curious to see because we made such a big deal of the city of Adelaide going back a couple of uh, issues ago. Um, I wanted to actually see that those whether those that actually raced the city of Adelaide, whether all of that work translated to results. Um, for the AKC, which is what it was all about. So um, we'll run through the results for the AKC, first of all, by class, and then I'll compare it to the um, the city of Adelaide. And then if I can get Lord Harrison over there to just keep a tally of the results of the drivers that were actually featured in them both. So get your listening ears on, Chief, and um, we'll see how we go. So AKC Cadet 9, Cruz Kelly first, followed by Jackson Brasher second, Lake Hay in third, Carter Lampard in fourth, and then Nicholas Kinder in fifth. Then in Cadet 12, <clears throat> we had uh, first place, Sebastian Eskandari Mirandi. Two, Hamish Campbell. Third was Lana Flack. Fourth was Riley Harrison. And fifth, Corey Carson. In KA4 Junior, we had Samuel March in first, Benjamin Munro in second, Kai Burke in third, Hunter Salvatore in fourth, and then in fifth was Kobe McKern or McEnany. Um, in KA3 Senior, my boy, Benito Linspettore Montalbano, eh? <laughs> followed by uh, Alex Ninovich in second, Joel McPherson in third, fourth was James Serra, and fifth, Corey Herbertson. Now, very, very quickly touching on Benito, he was dominant last year at that track uh, and walked away with uh, winning the KA3 Senior too, if my memory serves me correctly, or if not, he finished on the podium as well. 
Uh, didn't race the city of Adelaide, but it came out and was dominant right from the get-go. So, uh, L'Inspettore, my props to you. Um, tag 125, we had Brendan Nelson first, followed by Lee Nicolau, Braden Parkinson third, uh, Luke Bergens in fourth, and then Zachary Hurd in fifth. In X30, Lee's class, we had uh, Jace Matthews in first, Jaden Pope in second, Bo Pronesti in third, Jacob Dowson in fourth, and the Falcon, Harrison Hoey in fifth position. Well done, mate. Uh, in KA2, we had Toby Spinks in first. We had Daniel Quimby in second. In third place, we had Jake Rutkowski. And fourth, we had Harry Arnett. And then fifth, we had Likamaz uh, Mika Lemazuria. I nearly spelt my surname there, which was pretty cool. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, nice one for Mika. Part of the uh, the Grove Junior Development Program with Petruzzi course there as well. Uh, in KZ2, Cody Gillison first, uh, Jake Clarich in second. We had James Golding in third. Yes, the V8 supercar, James Golding. Uh, Josh Fife in, f uh, Fife in fourth, and then Jay Cool in fifth. So that was the, the classes that round out round KZ2 and, and also the AKC, full stop. All right. So now we round, we go to the city of Adelaide. And so what I've done is I've taken the classes that were relevant to AKC. So I haven't touched on restricted or anything of that nature. So in Cadet 12, we had Ayrton Dalmaso in first. Now Ayrton, who's a Scuderia Ferrari Club uh, member and our representative in New South Wales, was actually going to finish in the top three or top four, but had Carbure to trouble in the final. So he finished out of the top 10. All right. So Ayrton finished first at the city of Adelaide. Riley Harrison second. Corey Carson in third, Hamish Campbell in fourth, and then we had Noah Enright in fifth. Now, Noah was also an exception. He was really unlucky too. Had carburetor troubles and engine troubles in the final as well, but probably would have finished in the top five, I'd say, too. He had great pace all weekend. In Cadet 9, we had Cruz Kelly first, Blake Hay second, Jay Kostecki third, Jackson Brasher, and then we had fifth, Sebastian Tander. In KA2, we had Costa Taparis in first. We had Jack Wells in second. Daniel Quimby in third. We had uh, the Saint, Lewis Francis in fourth. And then we had Bean Holiday in, or Ben Holiday in fifth. In KA3 Junior, we had Leonir Ianella in first. Jacob Chandler second. Brody Norris in third. Riley Fortanier in fourth. And then we had Olivia, uh, sorry, Oliver Wickham in fifth. In KA3 Senior, Alex Ninovich first, Corey Herbertson second, Nicholas Succor in third, Jay Brown in fourth, and then Curtis Tennant in fifth. In KA4 Junior, Brody Norris first, Armand Hamilton in second, Pip Kazabene in third, Patrick Buckley in fourth, and Jack Beaton in fifth. In KZ2, we had Josh Fife in first. We had Henry Johnson second, Jay Cool in third, Samuel Dicker in fourth, and Taylor Aegis in fifth. In tag 125, we had Lee Nicolau in first. We had Matt, Max Chadasco in second, Thomas Gallagher in third, Cooper Brown in fourth. Now, Cooper was uh, had shown flashes of amazing speed at the AKC and uh, fell short in the final. So it was... Uh, top two or three in most cases of every heat as well as in qualifying. So I'm not sure what happened in the final, uh, but um, probably should have finished and had the speed to be top three or top four as well. And then uh, in fifth at the time was Winston, uh, Winston Van Laarhoven as well. X30, Jaden Pope first. Uh, second was Jackson Suzlin Harlow in second. Uh, third was Jacob Dowson. Fourth, Brad Jenner. And fifth, Leon Cordato. So therefore, the question is, how much did the city of Adelaide contribute to the performances of many at the AKC <clears throat> who did their homework and what did they, or didn't they learn from that? So there were a few names that did repeat. I must, must confess. There were a lot of names that did repeat and even the ones that, uh, that didn't repeat, they were probably not repetitive because of bad luck um, or they were just on the fringe of the top five in that sort of five to 10 range, but some other fast guys who didn't make the trip for the city of Adelaide uh, had jumped in and, and put their noses in front, so to speak. Mm. So the moral of the story is this. Um, preparation did did translate into those that did their homework. It did translate into um, some setup 
uh, and assistance as well. But even though, and the funny thing that I found was that the track conditions were vastly different. It was much, much cooler at the, at, um, over the Easter long weekend. But then also we had rain on the Sunday as well, which threw the cat amongst the pigeons in regards to results too. So um, very, very interesting correlation with that and what to take away from that. So I guess what that means is that if Southerns actually have the AKC round again next year and the City of Adelaide does coincide as the pre-event, my suggestion would be that you'll probably see more competitors make the switch over uh, as testing for the Southern Go-Kart Club event, I would suggest. We also suggest that the fact that there will be a brand new Southern Go-Kart Club by the time the next year's AKC or any race meeting takes place, there will be plenty of people that would want to uh, come on, come across and experience the new track. Mm, and the resurfacing as well, which will take away all the little markers and, and uh, indicators that a lot of us that test there quite frequently are used to as well. So, all right. Well, that was the AKC. Great event. Uh, I know um, I had to, we had a couple of other drivers actually give some insight as well. So I'll quickly give them some props too. Give me one second. So Josh Denton, uh, his feedback. Um, headed into the weekend, wasn't really sure how he'd go due to his performance or lack of performance at Todd Road. Um, we had an okay setup after the city of Adelaide. So we just started with that and slowly worked from there. So Tom Williamson, uh, their setup is that they've got a fleet of drivers, each driver's testing a little element in terms of their setup. Uh, and then what they'll do is at the end, they'll debrief and then they'll take the bits and pieces of what worked for each individual driver and then adapt it to each go-kart as well. So in qualifying, I was a little bit disappointed to be 10th because in the last practice we were like seventh. Uh, but once it came down to racing, it was all downhill from there for him. Uh, to put a long story short, I was on the straightening table every race. Uh, and that's not the chiropractic table. It's basically the, the jig to get rid of all the kinks in the chassis. Uh, a couple I could have avoided, but the others I couldn't avoid. Uh, I didn't end up doing the final because I had too much damage to my cart to continue. But overall, I think we had a pretty competitive cart, uh, obviously because Cody Gillis won and Josh Fife was freakishly quick too. But also I made progress with my driving, which I believe was the biggest thing to take away from the weekend. And for me, that is fundamental because you've got someone that's got a huge amount of experience like Josh, but he can still see uh, the improvements that is required for him to still excel as well. So for me, that that's a massive degree of humility as well. Absolutely. We all learn. We all never know it's perfect. And uh, even the Formula One drivers now, they'll still tell you that they're still learning things about themselves um, when they go through a hard weekend. So it's good to hear that Josh has taken the positives out of the weekend. Mm. Moral of the story, folks, never stop learning. And we'll be off to a break. We'll come back and we will review the Formula One. You're listening to Negative Camber with Jamie and Lee on Radio Italia Uno 87.6 FM. Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly supporting Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide. Hope you're enjoying the show. Um, we now start to cover Formula One. So from our last episode, we were sort of partway through the Melbourne Grand Prix uh, Grand Prix weekend. Um, and so what, I, what we'll do is we'll do a brief recap of the results. Uh, so first was Charles Leclerc, uh, followed by Sergio Perez. George Russell in third, Lewis Hamilton fourth, Lando Norris in fifth, Daniel Ricciardo in sixth, Esteban Ocon in seventh, Valtteri Bottas in eighth, Pierre Gasly in ninth, and uh, Mr. Albon in tenth position with a cracking drive. We'll touch on that shortly. Uh, before we go through what the drivers uh, said, Lee, some takeaways from the event. Uh, I suppose, obviously, the focus being on Mercedes-Benz at the moment where your mate and uh, George Russell um, were heaping praise on one another for their start, their lackadaisical start on 2022. But I think um, George is certainly uh, showing his worth at the moment. Yeah, look, it was to be expected, really. George is a talented driver. Well, we've been saying that all along, that you know, there was many times last year that, and the year before that he outdrove the true pace of the Williams and... When he did get the opportunity in the Mercedes, he uh, he should have taken his win. Um, so yeah, it just goes to show what a great driver he actually is, and um, put it all into perspective a little bit. Um, but yeah, they're uh, they're struggling a bit. Um, yeah, it's the rise and the fall of all the great teams in Formula One. We've 
seen eras, you know, Ferrari have had theirs, Williams have had theirs, uh, Red Bull had theirs. We went through Mercedes now and, and it looks like we're, we're back on onto the Ferrari train again. So mm. um, hopefully they can get back on top of it. You don't like to see them struggle too much, but uh, yeah, another car fighting at the front, which they're capable of doing if they get the setup right, um, would make it even more exciting. Yeah, it's become apparent they've got a fundamental aerodynamic flaw in that uh, um, in that car. Uh, ironically enough, it's related to the flaw, uh, but also it, it's come out overnight that they're also thinking that the, the radical side pod design is just not working at the moment. So I wouldn't be surprised if over the coming races, you'll probably start to see a more traditional looking side pod uh, in terms of what uh, is going to appear on that Mercedes. Um, the thing is, is that the budget cap that's in place at the moment uh, you know, in the past, you'd see teams come out with a B-spec car almost. They can't afford to do that now. If not, they're going to have to become very, very creative as to how they're going to roll that out. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be – and I think from what you are saying before, touching on with Williams, I think George is actually probably going to be better equipped to cope with what is at the moment in comparison to Mercedes-Benz in the past, a mediocre car. And so he's had three years of mediocrity. So he's used to that. Um, and as silly as that sounds, he's probably gone into Mercedes thinking he's going to get a world championship or be in contention for that. But at the same token, he's also now going into a car where it's the, the mediocrity level is actually the same for him um, in the respect that he's used to working through that process. Whereas Lewis, well, hasn't had to work with a car that's this poor, I'd probably would say since he's joined Mercedes. So let's say 10 years. It was 2009 that uh, the last time he had a car this bad when um, we saw the, the double diffuser come in and Braun GP were, uh, were dominating and Red Bull were the first to catch up at the second half of that season. So it goes to like, he'll, he'll help turn the team around. There's no doubt about that. He's definitely got the experience to do so. Um, I guess the, the beneficial thing for George is that, you know, he, uh, yeah, I suppose it is sort of mediocrity, but at least he's in there fighting for points every weekend now, whereas he was, you know, lucky to maybe scrap together a point um, if everybody else fell off the track when he was driving for the Williams. So for him, it's still a step up and he can still enjoy and he's beating the seven time world champion. So um, he can, he can say that, uh, that he's doing that quite, quite comfortably. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what also became apparent was that uh, Ferrari are definitely the team team to beat um, there. And we'll touch on Imola shortly, but um, their speed, uh, on different tracks and different environments and now in a variety of conditions is super impressive. So whatever work they've done uh, over the last two years has definitely um, borne some new fruit. Um, and um, they're actually going, they were meant to introduce a new floor uh, in Imola for, for this weekend. And uh, they uh, stopped it. They didn't go, go through with it. They're actually going to bring it into Miami. So, um, which is going to be cool. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see what sort of upgrades that's going to do and what enhancements that's going to do. But um, yeah, they'll, um, yeah, it's hard, hard to mess with something that's working. Hopefully it only makes it better. Just don't fix what's not broken really is my thoughts. And um, yeah, like I said, it's not crucial for them. They're still fast uh, this weekend in Imola. Um, they've got a car that's, that's working and they can spend the time to to make sure that the floor that they're going to bring in is, is going to do the, the right job. Um, they can spend more time in, in the simulator and in the wind tunnel, making sure that everything that they're searching for, it's going to fix. So yeah, look, it's going to be scary if they get faster, if everyone else is going to have to make quite a big jump to be close. Um, yeah, let's just see what happens, but uh, at least the racing's been exciting. You know, Red Bull aren't too far away at the moment. And we saw that again in, in Melbourne. Mm. Well, let's see what the drivers had to say at the Melbourne Grand Prix. Um, these were their thoughts. I'm very happy, but of course, this wouldn't have been possible. I think we had the best car today, and uh, it's no secret. And uh, and that's thanks to the to the team. They've done an incredible job. So I'm I'm extremely happy about the the result today. Yeah, a good result certainly. Um, so, but a lot of work to to do, you know, ahead. And I think these first three races we've been quite unlucky. Uh, with Bahrain, with Jeddah, but um, today was a bit of a concern. I think we got a few, few things quite wrong, fundamentally, and um, yeah, a lot of things to a lot of a lot of things that we have to review going forward. We were probably the fifth fastest team this weekend, and we came away with P3 and P4 ahead of the McLarens, ahead of the Alpines. Um, 
we've got to be happy with that. I think we did a great job today, Con yeah. uh, considering the pace deficit that we have to the guys up ahead. I think we did a good job. Is this the best that you guys can do until new bits start coming on the car? Just you're still taking as many points as you can week in yeah, week out. Yeah, that's that's the goal right now. Is why we still have these problems. Is just maximise. Uh, points and, and that's what we've done today. I guess a bit of a shame we lost both positions at the start just because uh, we had a bit too much wheel spin um, so we just didn't get that quite right but that happens sometimes um, but even after I think their pace was much stronger than ours anyway. It's nice nice to have a positive weekend at, at home uh, for sure it's been all, all weekends just been a, a step in the right direction and uh, you know a few weeks ago in Bahrain probably uh, many home fans were thinking oh no this is Maybe going to be a bit of a painful home race for Daniel, but uh, yeah, it was really nice to have such a quick turnaround. I think it, there was quite a big train of cars that we were stuck behind. There was more pace, uh, you know, available for us. And, um, and in the end, yeah, it's, it's a shame because I think top five could have been possible. What about a couple of moments with Lance? I think there was the weaving and then there was that moment where you went off track. Yeah, the, the weaving just made it, made it really hard for me to you know, decide where to go and it was a bit on the limit, I guess, and then, yeah, that pass obviously forced me to go off the track, so I don't think that's how you should race. Yeah, you can fight hard for it, uh, especially with Lance. I must say I enjoyed the battle, you know, I, it was probably the, the most enter entertaining uh, moment of the race. I feel like um, we went into this race thinking the best position we could finish was 19th, uh, and it wasn't like uh, close to 19th, it was a little bit no man's land, so... Uh, it was a bit of a surprise, we took a gamble, we just thought, why not change the strategy to everyone else? If we're going to finish 19th, we might as well try yeah, something new. And, uh, and the tyres last year, it was amazing. Yeah. After three races, I'm quite happy with the results we did so far, but uh, I definitely want to be fighting for the plus, or either plus next time. Um, yeah, um, I don't know why I got the penalty for that, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we tried to pick up a point. Didn't really have the pace, but uh, it was a good effort. Lots to learn, maybe some negative with it, but also a lot of positive. So we just, you know, got to understand it, take it, take it with us, and then hopefully be better in uh, Imola. We made a small gamble, I would say, with the hard tire, uh, because we felt like we were faster than, than our position, which which we were. But uh, again, you know, safety car came and uh, ruined completely the strategy. There was no any absolute no pace for my car and just really struggled. Whole run, um, yeah. Obviously, we had to work on more this year and to avoid next uh, next time, um, like this pace. Yeah. It's great to see Alex finish P10 in the end. Which, uh, we kind of saw at the end once it got to look at the TVs after the checker flag and saw he was uh, was there. So yeah, super happy for the team because it's been a yeah a real difficult start to the season. But uh, on my side, I think there's yeah clearly still um, quite a bit to find. Well, I think we've been uh, extremely unlucky with the safety car uh, in lap 20 and 22. A uh, safety car came in and uh, obviously we were looking for P6 or P7, which was a great comeback. And um, with that safety car, everyone regroups and uh, our, our, our race was gone. I mean, it was looking like quite an easy P2 anyway, but um, you have to finish, you know, to, to get that second place, even on a bad day. But uh, we're not doing that and that's, of course, extremely frustrating. Oh, I just said like a handful today in the race. Yeah, maybe too much of a handful to me today. So, um, yeah, I think I was probably trying to push a little bit too hard and uh, lost the car. I clearly made a mistake when the tire was uh, probably not ready to, to start over taking. You know, I, I misjudged the grip and, uh, and I made a mistake which cost me the retirement. So, clearly, not perfect. Uh, I haven't been perfect this weekend. We haven't been perfect as a team, clearly. And, and we need to, to analyze what we did wrong and, uh, and see if we can come back better. Yes, Carlos Sainz has got a lot of work to do uh, based on the tactical blunder in Melbourne. It breaks my heart to, to admit it, but um, yeah, it wasn't his best weekend. Mind you, it was largely mechanical related as well, but he didn't help himself with the, with the, uh, the lunge on, uh, on Zhao Gang Yu as well. No, and uh, it's not gotten any better for him. So my early pick for championship favourite, and uh, he's got the car to do it, and he's, uh, he's stepping on his own end. Uh, you didn't really watch the qualifying race last night, did you, my friend? It was a, yeah, a we were... yes that he's this time. Yes, I did watch it, but we were talking about Australia, so I was trying not to uh, not trying not to dilute the waters or muddy them up. I'm defending. I'm defending my boy. See, look, see, five. Yes, good stuff. Uh, yeah. You like that? Yeah. I'm defending my boy. 
Um, let's quickly fly through the winners and losers. Uh, so we will do winner, Charles Leclerc. On paper, Charles didn't, uh, Charles's, uh, I guess, thoughts on the sweeping changes to Melbourne. Thought that it wouldn't actually suit the Ferrari. But the reality turned out to be very, very different. Uh, the 24-year-old secured pole position by the biggest margin so far this year and went to dominate the Grand Prix uh, to secure his second win of the season and the fourth of his career. Did you know that it's the only it's only the second time in the last 18 years that a Ferrari driver has taken a Grand Slam win, which is pole, fastest lap, led every lap, leads the championship by 34 points, which is larger than anyone had led it last year, and obviously the win as well. Masterclass. Masterclass, exactly so right. So good, you're, I'm going to say, so, so, glute, so good was the performance. There was a bit of awkward silence on your end. So. No, I got, for the listeners at home, we're battling a little bit of delay and I can see you on Zoom and I see you talk and then I see you stop and then start talking again. So I'm, I'm flat out confused. It's part of my magic trick. I try to become a mime artist and then get you to guess what I say before it actually comes over the audio, uh, audio there link. There you go. So, there you go. Loser. Yeah, there you go. Loser, Max Verstappen. Uh, challenging weekend for Max, who never felt happy with his Red Bull at any point during the weekend and was always chasing balance and setup. Even so, the reigning champion was running a comfortable second in the race when his RB18 suffered a mechanical issue, which the team suspected was an external fuel leak. Don't worry. Uh, the retirement was his second in three races and left him 46 points adrift of Leclerc, which is not a good start considering how competitive Ferrari is at the moment. Um, winner, George Lee Harrison Russell. Uh, even, <laughs> even George was surprised when he was told after the race that he was now second in the driver's standings. Uh, so the Brit actually feels his car is the fifth fastest car on the grid right now. So despite the lack of performance, Mercedes in particular, George, have been ruthless, ruthlessly efficient at getting the most out of the package, symptomatic of his time at Williams. Did you know he has beaten Lewis for the second successive race, which has not happened in a very, very long time within Mercedes, probably not since Nico, really. Did you know that if we're going to talk about sprint races in uh, Imola, which we clearly watched, he beat him again. So it's now three successive races in a row. Mm, mm. Did you know that the next loser in my list is Aston Martin? And we have a gent by the name of Mike Crack who's the team principal, um, and that's not a word of a lie. So Mike Crack, the team principal, put it best. It was a weekend to forget. The team ended up with a significant repair bill with the cars being in three accidents. The only highlight was the quality of the work the mechanics did in rebuilding the cars. Did you know that they are now the only team not to score a point this season so far? Hard to believe considering the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, winner, Alex Albon. Faced an uphill battle in Melbourne after being relegated to the back when the car didn't have enough fuel in the back post-qualifying to supply a sample for testing. We've heard that before. He and the team nailed a risky strategy of perfection, running 57 out of 58 laps on the hard tyre, managing the degradation to perfection and pulling out enough of a gap to stop the softs on the final lap and stay in the top 10. Did Good you strategy. know? I can't believe that you actually pulled that off. Um, <laughs> what a what a drive. I know, it was an amazing drive. Did you know that it was actually his first point for Williams? Duh. But it was actually the first time that the team scored points in Australia since 2017. There you go. There you go. And so the loser, Carlos Sainz. Ugh, breaks my heart. This was, the, this was the King's most challenging weekend for months. Uh, the high, uh, you know, high fight and a hard fight to get comfortable with the car disrupted by a series of issues with the steering wheel. So he had that trouble all weekend. Qualified down in ninth, having lost his first Q3 run to a red flag, which was bad timing, but not enough time to prepare the tyres for a second run. And then the team changed his steering wheel just moments before the formation lap on Sunday as well. The car went into anti-stall. He dropped to 14th and then made a mistake trying to overtake Zhao Gang Yu on cold tyres to spin off into the gravel. Did you know? that this ended his 17 race point streak and run a 31 Grand Prix without retirement, both previously the longest active streaks. 
heartbreaking. Uh, pretty good job to get there, but very heartbreaking. And uh, obviously he was hungry to make up spots early on there and just o- overstepped the mark. Mm. We will be back uh, after a short break and we'll come back and we'll review the Imola sprint race and also do a roundup of the results of the top 10 and qualifying. You're listening to Negative Camber with Jamie and Lee on Radio Italia Uno 87.6 FM. Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly supporting Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide. We will continue the topic of Formula One and we are at the Grand Prix di Emilio Romagna held at the much infamous uh, Imola circuit. So uh, overnight we had the sprint qualifying, but um, I, I suppose we'll do a little bit of analysis and I guess the main news that came out of the week was uh, Ferrari re-signing Carlos Sainz uh, with a brand new deal. Um, and so there was some talk, and in, I would say innuendo, but talk rummaging through the pit lane, the fact that uh, Ferrari had uh, offered it to kind of settle Carlos a little bit after the Australian performance. Uh, what was your take on on the news that came out earlier in the week, Mr. Harrison? Of course, I think he deserves it. He's, um, you know, done, done all good with them last year and put in a stellar performance. He's one of the better drivers on the grid and uh, definitely deserves a new contract and, and to stay at the team for longer. He's had a rough start to 2022, like you said, but it's uh, any, it could happen to anyone. Um, we've seen greater drivers than him have rough rougher starts, that's for sure. So I don't think there's there's too much to be said about settling nerves. He'll uh, he'll jump back on and be as feisty as ever. Yeah. Well, there's a little bit of analysis that goes behind why Ferrari did what they did. And I wanted to sort of troll through that a little bit um, just to give our listeners and especially our Italian audience a bit of a background. So um, what actually, um, how this all started was really sort of towards the end of last year. So when when F1 had the uh, the title showdown at, uh, at Abu Dhabi, um, Sainz's podium, which was actually quite an impeccable drive, uh, was actually went largely unnoticed. So it was Sainz's finest weekend of of his F1 campaign. So he qualified fifth. He was only 0.06 of a second off third. And he didn't actually put a wheel wrong during the race as well. So he grabbed a podium purely based on performance. Now, admittedly, the safety car helped a little bit as well. But it actually ended up being his fourth podium of the year. And what it did do was it actually leapfrogged him ahead of uh, team out Charles Leclerc to finish fifth in the driver's standings. And it was the first time uh, Leclerc had actually been beaten in the driver's championship since he's been in Formula One. So what it meant was it also, at that point in time, led to his 15th successive point score, which was the best record of any driver. So at that point in time, um, this season was always going to be Carlos's last in terms of the current contract with Ferrari. And the best way to get a new deal really is to do your talking on the track. And that's exactly what he did. So when Ferrari lured him away from McLaren on that two year deal, a big focus on their analysis into, into Sainz was um, his data. And that was their focus was on his actual telemetry. So they could see that Sainz was fast in particular in race conditions. And they could see that he showed a, a relentless upward trajectory. So it was not blemish free uh, as obviously this season has shown. But each time a struggle was encountered, he actually quickly found a way out. So Sainz's form after his failure to score in France last year on a weekend where Ferrari were lost in terms of understanding the tyres was so good that Ferrari knew that he was the real deal. He was the man. So his performance in the last five races of 2021 uh, was actually very eye-catching for the hierarchy at the Scuderia. So that he was actually able to beat Leclerc and push him as regularly as he did in his maiden season, probably even surprised senior management as well. And Leclerc is a very interesting case because he is probably the first genuine graduate of the Ferrari Driver Academy. So if he's not successful, then that actually doesn't reflect well on the Driver Academy. And that's the, the Italian's response to the Red Bull Driver Academy, which has been quite uh, quite infamous in itself. So what also what Ferrari also did see was that the relationship between Leclerc and at the time Vettel was actually becoming uh, quite uh, fractious. And it was actually a relief for Ferrari that Sainz and Leclerc got on really, really well. Uh, they gel off track, uh, much like Sainz and Lando Norris did as well, who they remain actually quite good friends. 
and but they were still actually to put, able to push each other hard on track. So, you know, really, you've got Ralph, uh, Ralph you've got Mick Schumacher stay, uh, in the wings, but anything other than, you know, keeping Sainz on board at Ferrari right now whilst Leclerc is in, in his current contract makes no sense to actually change it. Mm-hmm. So Ferrari sat down actually with, with Charles before Christmas on a new deal, and that would run before the end of 2023. So Ferrari wanted to keep him. Uh, Mattia Bonotto was particularly impressed with the way Sainz had gone about settling into the team and getting performance out of the car. And so they instigated the discussion. Um, they knew that other teams were interested in securing the Spaniard services and they couldn't afford to hang about. So um, my my the understanding is, is that Sainz's management spoke to at least one major rival. Um, you always take the call. But their priority was to stay at Ferrari. So... Uh, the Saints family wanted more than a one-year deal. Um, his last two contracts have been multi-year and security was also a, a very big premium for him in playing a key role um, in helping him finish uh, strong towards the end of last year, but also focus on the job at hand rather than risk getting distracted by the contract talks. So their push was for another two-year deal, which would take him up to the end of 2024, ironically, when Leclerc's deal expires. So what that does do is it shows that um, Ferrari's commitment to the Spaniard and it would be a deserved reward for pace and results that he's actually delivered since joining along with a high level of feedback which has been key to the development of the 2022 car. What it also does is it actually gives Ferrari stability as they look to build on to a really good start this year uh, and what it also means is that they're building now as genuine title favourites. So very quickly the two sides came to an agreement and then it became a case of nailing down the details of the contract. Um, Sainz's as team or his management team knew they had a strong asset, one of the most prized drivers on the grid right now, and therefore he pushed for improved terms. So it wasn't ideal that Sainz suffered his first DNF since the Russian Grand Prix, but it also did not set alarm bells ringing either. Ferrari were already convinced that Sainz is their man and they feel that uh, the result was an anomaly. So with a car capable of regularly scoring podiums and challenging for wins, Sainz was proving he could get the job done and his relationship with Leclerc was holding up well too, despite the growing pressure of a potential championship challenge. So all that was delaying the result was just finessing the small print uh, with Ferrari, knowing that they were in a strong position given the quality of the car that they've delivered for the new rules as well. So in putting pen to paper, what they've done now is both drivers are locked in for the next two years. It gives them really important stability, while rivals Mercedes and Red Bull have uncertain lineups in the years ahead, outside of Max obviously being cemented long-term as well. So what it means is that they can devote all their attention to converting the current class leading car into a championship winner. Makes perfect sense for me. What are your thoughts, Mr. Harrison? Of course, we said that just before. Um, makes perfect sense. He's one of the better drivers on the grid and you don't want him to go somewhere else and, and take his experience and his, his knowledge uh, to other teams. So you, you got to lock him down and, and why rattle the cage? Um, it'll be interesting to see if it does end up being a title fight. You know, he started the year pretty poorly. Um, so he's going to have to ma- ma- you know, mount a serious comeback if he's going to cause a fight at the end of the championship. But uh, if, it, if it does come down to that, how good that friendship uh, will remain when it, they're taking points off of each other for the title. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, he blotted his coffee book in qualifying by spinning and hitting the wall at the exit of the Piratella. Um, and so, although the right, so I think it was. Um, and so what it meant was that he started the sprint race. So this round was the first round of, uh, Eddie Miller was the first round of the sprint race. And he started from 10th position, uh, but it was a, a fantastic comeback. And so here are the highlights. I'm very It's lights out, away we go for the sprints, and Charles Leclerc gets a very good start indeed. Verstappen's been caught napping, maybe Perez making ground early on. Leclerc takes the lead on the sprint. It's Leclerc with Magnussen almost on the grass. Verstappen second, then comes Norris. K-Mag going wheel to wheel with Daniel Ricciardo and onto the curb. Carlos 
Sainz is trying to make up places. Looks like Perez has got past Danny Ricciardo as they file through Tamburello and onto the field of chicane. Kevin Magnussen having a great old scrap there with Sergio Perez and Lewis Hamilton getting bogged down a little bit and his teammate George Russell too, not making gains where they would want. Yeah, the initial getaway from Max, it just did not happen. And then you could see, it almost looked like he lost the sink ship because you could see his head moving, but crucially, he stayed in second place. But listen to the crowd oh. as Leclerc took the lead. And already a yellow flag as someone's gone off the track, and I think it's Joe Guan Yu in the Alfa Romeo. And there is Joe Guan Yu. Looks like his sprint is over by the end of the first lap. On the way to Inter Piratella we go. And there's Joe Guan Yu on the outside, Gasly on the inside. And I did think this track was narrow, and that rather proved yeah, it. Yeah, two came together. I'm not really sure where Zhu thought Gasly could go. And with the safety car in and the green flags flying, we get racing once again. This is lap five of 21 for the sprint here in Imola this afternoon. And Max Verstappen a long way back by the time they put on the brakes into Tamburello. Magnussen looks a little bit closer to Lando Norris, who's in third. Then comes Sergio Perez. Danny Ricciardo oh. getting all out of shape there. Fernando Alonso, and that should let Carlos Sainz through in the other Ferrari, but Sainz picking up the slipstream and then trying to make his way round Villeneuve. Can't quite force his way past. Sainz got a love the run on the Alpine. The Ferrari's looking beautiful behind it. And had he had DRS, I think he'd be going forward, but of course he would because he's in a Ferrari. And is he going to go the long way around? Alonso's not going to make it easy, but a fellow Spaniard, and I don't think he'd put up too much of a fight. There goes the DRS, one DRS zone here at Imola, and you can see the closing speed that Sergio Perez has got. It's a mighty closing speed for Sergio Perez. Long before they get to the chicane, Sergio Perez is ahead of Kevin Magnussen and up into fourth. To the DRS zone we go. We're following Kevin Magnussen, following him, Ricardo, following him is Sainz, and ahead of those, Sergio Perez looks like he's got ahead of Lando Norris, and he has. Towards the chicane we go. Is Ricardo going to go down the inside on Kevin Magnussen? He is. Beautiful move by Daniel Ricardo. Puts his McLaren up into fifth. Huge differences for Red Bull. If both Red Bulls can finish second and third, of course, what that does is better protection tomorrow at the start to fight the Ferrari of Charles Leclerc, and of course his slipstream is so crucial, heading down into the first braking zone after the start. Dark clouds still hovering over the track, with the Tafosi roaring on and giving heat to Carlos Sainz as he sets now after Kevin Magnussen, who hasn't got DRS. Ricardo's too far away. There goes Sainz, bouncing away, but he can put up with a porpoising as sixth place is his by the time they get to the Tamburello chicane. Got DRS, you can Here see. There We're you go. Board, and he's getting closer. He's getting closer. Ricardo moves over to the right-hand side, but really, that was not a fight. Daniel Ricardo was equipped to fully fight. Valtteri Bottas now on Fernando Alonso, who's been given a black and white flag for weaving on the straight. He can't weave now, because if he did, he'd weave straight into Valtteri Bottas. And they're going wheel to wheel down the straight here. Valtteri Bottas on the inside, later on the brakes. Fernando Alonso has to concede the points. And Valtteri Bottas in the Alfa Romeo moves up into eighth place. Three laps to go then as Leclerc sets off down that main straight. We're on board with Max Verstappen. Has he got enough distance to try and close in? No. Just runs out of straight at the end. Buffer close now, Crofty. Is he going to get a nice run out of that, sir? He's there or thereabouts. He wants to be left alone to do what he can do best. And what he can do very well is produce some overtakes from a long way back. Look at the bouncing on the Ferrari. The Red Bull's coming at him. Verstappen goes around the outside into the chicane, stays on the track. Max Verstappen takes the lead at the sprint here at Imola. And we've had passes for the lead in a sprint for the first time. The first sprint of 2022. And I hope they're all like this. This is epic. Brilliant car control. And he didn't Stafford. turn in, did he? He left no. enough space just to let him go, but beautifully judged at the second part of that as well. Max Verstappen, lost out at the start here, has made amends by the time he gets to the chequered flag. What a tussle with Charles Leclerc. The sprinters flash by, and it's ended with victory for Max Verstappen here at Imola. The championship leader, Charles Leclerc, comes home in second. Sergio Perez completes the podium places and takes third for Red Bull, who now go into second in the Constructors' Championship. Rather get the feeling the drivers like these sprints and, and like to be involved in such a short burst of fevered activity. As do we. It's uh, that was probably for me. Oh, look, Brazil was was a great sprint, mainly highlighted by the the Hamilton comeback. But from a 
from an overtaking perspective and a drafting perspective and that type of thing as well, I reckon this one was probably the best overall across the whole grid. I, yeah, I don't know if Imola is the best choice for a sprint. Um, it's a hard track to pass on, but they put a sprint race on there, which is trying to make it more exciting. Like the race was close, um, but in terms of overtaking battles, um, yeah, there wasn't really a whole bunch going on. It was a lot of a lot of train action, but uh, at least uh, the fight at the front between Max and uh, Charles continued, and it was clean again. Um, say no more. Um, and yeah, came down to a race of uh, of tire wear. Yeah, look, um, it's definitely going to throw the cat amongst the pigeons in terms of tire wear. I mean, clearly the race is going to be between Ferrari and Red Bull again. I think. Um, you'll probably find that if they start to get uh re i mean in charles case i overheard him in charles case last night i overheard his comments at the end uh to max were that uh, rear tires were gone for him uh, and he was getting some graining at the front so i probably would suggest that you might even be looking at maybe a two possibly a three stopper if the tire wear is going to be as severe as what it is because i don't think you're going to be able to get i mean unless they all go to the the ultra hard compound tire um, if they're going to look for a medium, they're not going to get the the longevity out of the race because those tyres were shot probably around maybe lap 15, 10, and, 15. Uh, on the the hard tyre was not fast rate. enough, obviously, with Magnussen showing that he was a sitting duck. So um, the hard tyre is not really going to be much of an option. So it could open up the, an interesting strategy. Another, uh, another thing that could open up an interesting strategy is that... Uh, at 2 p.m., 3 p.m. local time there, which is when the race is supposed to start, they are expecting rain. Um, so it could be it could be a wet start to the race as well. Oh, if that's going to be the case, that's going to be brilliant. But um, um, the other thing to note too, McLaren had a strong showing as well. It was good to see Danny Rick, um, who uh, probably outshone Norris, I think, in, in terms of adapting to a car that didn't get a lot of mileage in, after missing out P2 for the, the bulk of it. Um, I, I thought he, that was probably one of his better drives. Yeah, definitely did a good job after missing a whole session on track. And um, it would have been interesting to see what Lando could have done if he hadn't put himself in the gravel in qualifying as well. Um, he was on for a screamer. Um, yeah, the McLarens, we touched on it last last uh, two weeks ago. Their brake issues at Bahrain and uh, then again in Jeddah were the reason that they were sort of off the pace and now that they've got back on top of it, you can see that they're probably best of the Mercedes cars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, um, you know, speaking of Mercedes, man, are they in Struggle Street. Um, there, was, there was a stat that came out, I think, uh, probably earlier in the week that each race that's gone through so far gap to first place has actually gotten bigger so they've gone from three half a second out to nearly two seconds in the first three or four races of the year which you know they're meant to be progressing and in fact they're going backwards yeah. so i mean weather played a part in this there's no doubt about it um so it's hard to make that that's probably being a little bit harsh but they are in a world of trouble world of trouble yeah and uh it's pretty clear that there's no easy road out of it. Otherwise, they'd be getting back on top of that stuff by now. But uh, they're, they're, in a, they're in a world of pain. Mm, 100%. Uh, I actually think uh, Mick Schumacher is going to actually get his first points of the season, providing it's a dry race. I think he showed some... The Haas has definitely got some pace. I think him and K-Mag are probably going to uh, play a bit more of a role in the race than what we actually think. Because the, the likelihood would be that they're not going to start with the hard or the harder compound tire, I would suggest. No, and it was interesting to see that Nick turned him on quicker than Magnussen and looked after him and was actually faster. If you look at relative race pace, um, he closed the gap down to to Magnussen. So Magnussen really struggled. Um, I agree. I think Mick Schumacher's just got to survive the first couple of laps, and Haas have got a fast car. It's fast enough to be up in sort of the top five. Um, positions at this Grand Prix, mm. that Ferrari power plant in the back of it. It's, uh, they've obviously got some sharing going on there and, and they've turned on their car this year. Um, but it's it's good to see that Mick is is doing well and he's going to take it to Kevin this uh, this weekend. Mm. Well, Red Bull and Ferrari front row as well. It's almost like a direct replication of, of the first row. Uh, very quickly, oh, Prophet, 
um, in your magic ball of yours, uh, your crystal ball, I should say. Uh, who's your tip for tonight? Uh, it's I'm going to go with science. I'm going to go with science from fourth place, second row. Um, just just got a feeling tonight, but uh, look, um, Leclerc will be hard to stop if uh, if a Ferrari can turn on their tyres um, and and Red Bull. So I think uh, science Verstappen Leclerc podium uh, one two and three. Yeah, very similar thoughts. I actually think Carlos will win, um, and I, and I say that with and without the uh, I suppose the bipartisanship, I want to call it that. Uh, Ferrari won two for me with Max third, so it'll be Carlos uh, followed by Leclerc with Max third, and possibly Checo fourth would be for me top four. I've got Danny Rick in fourth and Lando in fifth. I think uh, they if they can switch on, they'll be they'll be all over it. Mm, mm. Well, we shall see. It should be an absolutely cracking race. And I think there's going to be a lot more overtaking than what we're going to give credit for without the aid of DRS too. So uh, we shall watch this space. And if it rains, well, it's anyone's guess what's going to happen after that. We'll just have to wait and see. So we'll be off to a break. And then when we come back, we'll cover MotoGP. You're listening to Negative Camber with Jamie and Lee on Radio Italia Uno 87.6 FM. Welcome back to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly supporting Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide. With me on the line in Miami is my dear friend, Mr. Lee Harrison. Um, we haven't done MotoGP in a while, mate, so uh, I thought we'd, uh, we'd go back to cover that and review the Circuit of Americas. That sounds like a good plan. Yeah, it's been a little while. It's been hard to get over here. It's not really played too much on the television, or if it is, I haven't seen to find the channel for it. But it uh, seems like everything else is played on the TV here, the Professional Cornhole League, uh, lacrosse. Uh, they had the World Tag Championships on today. So, yeah. I mean, I'm so surprised that MotoGP doesn't get a gig, but hey. Uh, well, uh, considering how big a sport it is globally, um, and the Americans love their motorcycle riding. I find that fascinating. Absolutely, yeah. I'll have to um, maybe I have to look harder next time. Yeah, um, mind you, mate. You do work thirteen-hour shifts, and you do you know bust your backside. So it's, it's understandable. You can't do everything. <laughs> this is true, but anyway, uh, I think Coda was one of the ones that I did actually get to see a little bit of because it was on at a decent time for us in the afternoon here. So sat next to one of the guys at work, and uh, we managed to to make a party out of it. Mm. Oh, good. Good to hear. Speaking of party, uh, Ennio Bastianini is having a great party at the moment. He uh, got the overall result uh, for the Circuit of Americas. I'll just run through the top 10 before we do some highlights. So Ennio Bastianini finished first. Alex Rins was second. He actually didn't spin the bike. It's, it's amazing. Um, Jack Miller was third. Uh, Duan Mir was fourth. Uh, Francesco Bagnaia fifth. Mark Marquez in sixth, which was a fantastic comeback drive considering the starting issues that he had. Fabio Quattararo is seventh, Jorge Martin in eighth, Johan Zarco in ninth, and Maverick Vinales rounding up the top ten. So before we have a quick discussion, we'll just go through the top five moments of that Grand Prix. The red lights will come on very, very shortly as it's soon going to be time to tame the horsepower rodeo. Who's going to be our king of Kota in 2022? Great launch off the line by Jorge Martin. Likewise, Jack Miller. Here comes Fabio Quattro as well on the inside. Where's Mark Marquez? He's plumb last, yeah, he Matt. The he start. had a terrible start. Mark Marquez didn't get away at all. He is back right at the very back of the field. Here comes Martin up the inside of Jack Miller into turn 19. Beautifully done. Nothing that Miller could do about there. He left the door open. Martin said, Thank you very much. Miller, though, trying to exact instant retaliation. He does. This is a real intense battle raging here between Fabio Quattararo, Alex Rins, and Juan Miller. Here comes Zarco up the inside of Peko Bagnai. Bagnai hasn't got the early race pace to be expected from him so far, the Italian, although he fights straight back. Zarco 
nibbing that place on the inside of him for turn 12, just running a little bit hard. Through turn 10, now into 11, you can see Rins now closing in on the back and having a go at Zarco. That's the kind of risky move he has to make because there's no way in a million years he'll be able to out, out drag a Ducati down this 1200 metre back straight. This has been a supreme ride by Alex Rins. Look at that Zarco, he got in hot, didn't he, Rins? Into turn number 11, trying to pay that's back balls. on Bagnaia. Oh, that's a raid, that's, gonna not, that's not going to work out. And he's going <laughs> to lose places to Pekka Bagnaia and to Juan Mir. Here he goes. Brilliant, that by Fabio <laughs> Quattro. That was a, a real big nudge on Zarco, wasn't it, to seven. Zarco sent out to the marbles, and that allows Mar Marquez through then. Mar Marquez picks up another place. He's up now into eight spot. Here comes Alex Rinzen. This has been his favourite overtaking spot in the whole race. On the inside of Miller, into turn number 11. He's in second. Miller unable to cut it back and try and get the drive onto this back straight. Rins will have to go defensive into turn 12. Miller is looking to just blast straight past, and indeed he does. He'll now want to cover the inside line himself and stop Alec Rins, Rins from getting up the inside. Rins too far back into 12. Miller looks like he's held on to second place for now. Just a few more corners to go. Miller holds on for third place. Here comes Rins up the inside of Guadalajara into turn 12. Is he in a little bit hot? It looks like he is, although he'll have the inside line now for 13, yet Quattararo can't turn in. So a bit of a block pass there from Rins on Quattararo into 12. Alex Rins has got great pace at this stage. He's on here go, comes he Rins. Here comes Alex Rins again. We've seen this two or three times from him. It's the block pass, just trying to find a way through on Zarco. Here comes Alex Rins up the inside of Jorge Martin into turn seven. Beautifully done by the Suzuki man. Here he comes in the inside of Miller into turn 19. Has he got the job done for second place? Alex Rins with a stunning last lap. He takes second. See, here's a look at the start. Keep it out, Mark Marquez just doesn't get away, just bogs it down completely. That looks like the launch control or something was still activated or something there. Look at the data here. Marquez then into the points already. It's taken him, what, two and a half laps to get himself up into 14th place. Now we cut back to Mark Marquez, who is now past Maverick Vinales. Next target for him is the KTM of Brad Binder in 12th. Mark Marquez steaming up the inside there, Brad Binder. Now then, Mark Marquez, blue on blue, Repsol Honda on Repsol Honda, and Marquez just nudges his teammate, Polis Vargo aside through turn number 12, and Marquez then on lap number seven, and finally his rapid recovery continues. He's back in the top 10. Marquez two on Alicia Spargo, then we saw him going up the inside of him. Ladies and gentlemen, who is the fastest man on the circuit? It's <laughs> Mark Marquez. Marquez has got through on Fabio Quattararo. The 93 attack continues unrelenting. Here comes a raid up the inside. Marquez on Martin. Marquez gets the job done at turn one. He's now into the top six. What a recovery. What a heroic ride this has been from the back of the grid at turn one. Marquez with four laps to go inside the top six. Bashini, can he get a slingshot out of turn number 12? He's had the fastest Ducati, the fastest bike all weekend. Here it goes. He winds that GP21 up to top gear. Here comes the move on the inside, using the slipstream. And there, Bashini then leads. He hits the front at turn 12 for the first time. Four and a half laps to go. And there, Bastianini, all hail the new king of Kota in 2022. And there, Bastianini takes a famous second win of the season here at the Red Bull Grand Prix of the Americas. But there is, ladies and gentlemen, your new king of Kota and the world championship leader, and there, Bastianini. What a race! What a fantastic race that was. And Bastianini is just, he's making the, the current factory Ducati bikes look very second rate. And quite clearly the 2021 bike was a very, very handy weapon. It's maybe one Jack Miller's uh, open to the option of staying with Ducati if it means a demotion uh, next year. He's seen how good the uh, year previous bikes are and uh, is, is happy to ride for them. Or, is, you know, maybe... Ducati's just that far ahead of their time. They've built a bike for next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, um, the one thing I find really fascinating is that the riders at the moment, this reminds me so much of the 2020 title, where the riders are, are doing their best to actually not really seize the early initiative. And it's, you know, on paper, it's giving the guys like 
Bastianini, who really shouldn't be contesting for wins on paper, a chance to actually play a major role in this championship because all of a sudden momentum belief is going to, and belief, I should say, is going to play a massive role in the outcome of this. And, you know, that's what capitalised with Mia as well. Absolutely. It's going to be uh, who can capitalise the, the most points the most often. I don't think there's going to be a, a runaway winner in this one. Um, and, and, and there's going to be, like you said, uh, any of sort of seven or eight riders are going to be able to win this championship um, come the end of the year. Yeah, the uh, the qualifying in Porto Mal is uh, is going to be very interesting as well. Uh, in uh, with the result of that, meaning that uh, you know the usual suspects are up at the front, but uh, Mark Marquez has certainly um, has made quite a hefty comeback, uh, considering he had another high side overnight as well in in the morning practice. Yeah, absolutely, and and it's. Uh... Gonna, it's only a matter of time before all these head knocks catch up with him, but mm. he put in an absolutely stunning ride um, in Kota after, yep. like he said, not getting the start there and uh, missing missing the start. If he'd gone into the first corner where he should have, he probably would have come away and won that race. Yeah, exactly right. So, uh, But, uh, yeah, I think it was also a critical result for Jack Miller in particular, uh, but also for uh, early title favourite Banyaya to actually steady the ship and get their, their season back on track. Yeah, good to see Jack um, stay on the bike and, and keep it upright. You know, he's only 30 points off the championship lead at the moment, so he's still doing everything that he can um, to to stay in it. Um, he's seventh place in the championship. If he can get some consistent runs going, he's, he's going to make up that ground pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I've got a funny feeling with Suzuki getting their act together in terms of straight line speed. I think Mia is is going to be he's been very consistent um and i think mia if they're not careful they're going to get onto a run soon i think mia might be the uh might be the man uh, i think jorge martin has had this had the pace uh but um just hasn't quite got the consistency yet um but um yeah if they're not careful mia might uh, might play a massive role in this title race yeah and rins as well um Rins and Mia both equally as good as each other. So they could uh, definitely take off if they get a good run together. What's surprising for me is um, the, the lack of pace in the second KTM squad with uh, Remy and Raul Fernandez. You've got uh, the other two bikes, Binder and uh, Miguel Oliveira, scoring points consistently, but uh, Fernandez and Gardner just struggling to, um, struggling to make the most of their move up to the MotoGP ranks. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, Remy, Remy, again, showing some pace. He's finding it a bit of a challenge at the moment. Uh, probably not on the leading KTM team, but um, uh, you know, never know. I mean, they're still predicting bad weather. They've had uh, rain on and off all weekend in Portugal. So uh, you can never say never. It's pretty, pretty crowded weather all throughout that sort of area at the moment. So, yeah, we might see another exciting race in both the uh, F1 and in the MotoGP this weekend with some weather getting in the way. Mm, one can only hope. Well, it should be interesting. We'll do the review of Portimao in our next show, but uh, we will come back uh, for the final stint where we will find out what grinds your gears, my friend, and uh, maybe I might slip in a joke or two. You're listening to Negative Camber with Jamie and Lee on Radio Italia Uno 87.6 FM. Welcome to Negative Camber, the motorsport show, proudly supporting Scuderia Ferrari Club Adelaide. And we are on the last lap of the show. It's gone quick again, ladies and gents. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to find out uh, what grinds Mr. Lee Harrison's gears. Now it's time for Grind My Gears with Jamie and Lee. Over to you, Elvis. Oh man, like I touched on it earlier before in the in the show about it just being an absolute madhouse and feeling like I'm racing down into turn one at Spa on the forklifts every time I jump out, whether it's driving around a JCB or a telehandler or another five people on golf carts or forklifts. But what really grinds my gears is when these people that are driving this machinery just meander around like they've got no sense of where they're going who they're going to go and see and then stop to talk to every tom dick and harry on the bloody way from a to b and you're in the middle of a one way either way path tunnel hallway 
And this guy just stops to talk to the cleaning guy and the, the person emptying the bin on his left. And it takes you 25 minutes to get somewhere. It should have taken you five minutes. Just absolutely grinds my gears, sends me through the roof. I have to get on the horn so many times on the forklift that I've got to start wearing earplugs because I'm about near blowing my eardrums out. But it's just absolutely mental. Wow, that's a lot to take in. But, um, you know, they're, they're quite service orientated in America, I understand. <laughs> Yeah, of course. It's where they're very service orientated. And if service is by stopping and talking to every single person on their journey to make sure they're having a good day, then they're doing a great job. <laughs> but, you know, look, I can't, I can't complain too much. It just, uh, it just can wind you up when you know that you've got a job and you're going from A to B, but you've got to spend an extra 10 minutes to get there. Do you know what I found out what also grinds your gears? Uh, I discovered during the week, safety vests that are not hung up properly on chairs. <laughs> This is Formula One, mate. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So it's what just that... the little things. It's just the little things. It's um it's just details, details, details. And if your neatness at one spot is not accounted for, then your neatness on the next spot is not accounted for. And it just goes and goes and goes. And it's about responsibility and accountability. We're all in it together and we're all there for the presentation. And when you've got high profile guests coming in, you can't just have things slewed all over the shop no that's fair enough uh i understand that and especially given the the nature of the operation you need you need you're all at, on deadlines and speed and efficiency you can't uh, necessarily neander around and and waste time you know you know talking about superficial stuff in a not so super well it's kind of superficial you could say formula one is it's a superficial world yeah. but you know what i mean yeah it, the, yeah. the scope of the operation is too much to, to do that sort of stuff but um does that mean that um Mr. Lee Harrison actually turned into Rev Head Harry at that particular driver that was blocking your path. I was fuming. I was on the horn, um, which is not uncommon here in America. So the people are very used to it. Um, but yeah, no, I was, I was quite amped up. Yeah, I can imagine. Can, I can, imagine. can handle a forklift though. Like I'm swinging pallets around like they're nothing. So uh, it's, it's pretty fun. Sounds like a bit of a joke and all. And speaking of which, I come to my favorite segment of the week. Well, the fortnight, I should say. James Jones. I have to brace, brace myself. Now it's time for Jamie's joke of the week. Let's get ready to laugh our socks off. I, I always maintain that one of the highlights of recording this uh, in the wonderful podcast city studios, and a big thank you to Ron and the team for uh, for helping us out coordinating this is I get to see your facial expressions. I can't wait to do it in person. It's going to be so cool. But I, what I do know is that I'm going to walk away with a lump on my head because you lump me. Oh, you want it. All the uh, people that are listening, if you want to see my facial expressions that Jamie rates so highly, you can jump on the YouTube channel and uh, and watch the video. Well, speaking of which, before I get into the jokes, um, it's actually back up and running. So episode 25 is now premiering on YouTube. So jump onto our YouTube channel, type in Negative Camber, the Motorsports Show. You'll see our, our beautiful faces and our famous logo. And uh, you can start to watch. But there's also some uh, playlists and stuff like that that we've compiled over time as well. Anyway, today I saw someone waving and I wasn't sure whether they were waving at me or at someone behind me. And in other news, I was fired from my lifeguard job. Oh, uh, yes. That's great. Look at it. Come on, laugh. <laughs> laugh, I dare you. <laughs> when you break me, I will laugh. Uh, you're smiling. Give me something to laugh at. I'm getting close. There's, so, there's nothing else left to do. All the stuff <laughs> is to smile. <laughs> My wife thinks it's weird that I stare at the window during a heavy rainstorm. <laughs> it would be a lot less weird if she just let me in. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the funny part of that is that it's true so bianca <laughs> we all know that it happens and uh mm -hmm. this is what yeah. it is <laughs> this was that one you wrote yourself <laughs> no that was the funny part about it um all right uh let's see <laughs> all right so the boss we'll call it shay so Shay says, do you think you can come in on Saturday? 
I know you enjoy your weekends, but I need you here. Me? Yeah, sure. No problems. I'll probably be late though, as public transport on weekends is slow. So Shay says, what time will you get here? Me? Monday. <laughs> mm. Mm. It's the mark, that one. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, now I heard that you actually had a dad joke. So- I, I may, I may be able to contribute. I can probably jump in with one of these each week. I have a, uh, what do you name someone joke? For okay. You. All right. Go for it. All right. So what would you name a lady with one leg shorter than the other? I have no idea. Eileen. <laughs> yes this is great oh this is fantastic oh man that's good i love it that's some of your finest work harrison that's been uh, that's probably i was gonna say i was better than the last five minutes that you've contributed to but that was fantastic uh, <laughs> nice one. i like this i think negative- I don't, <laughs> it only took me one joke to get the applause you've had about nine goes at it and get bomb every time oh uh, I'll just laugh more and more now too, because I'll just get worse and worse. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, uh, anything else that we need to cover before we, uh, we call it a day? Look, no, it's already called that, um, but I will be off to bed right now. Um, if you've been texting me during the ad breaks and uh, telling me that I look ready to fall asleep here at my desk. So I, uh, I should heed your warning and uh, do that before I fall asleep on you. <laughs> Well, we'll see. Actually, come to think of it, I think uh, we may be taking a three-week hiatus because the next show would actually be on the day, or, well, actually during the Grand Prix. So, Correct, um, yes. We, the we next like... show is scheduled on Grand Prix weekend for me. So, yeah, um, so yeah. yeah, we might have to come back in three weeks, which will be your return. So I'll you... be live back in the studio by then. Oh, can you imagine the hug I'm going to give you when I see you? Oh, how exciting. It's going to be great. I can't wait. Yeah, exactly. Shay can cry <laughs> her hands off me first. Well, I mean, you're in lockdown, aren't you? Aren't you very COVID conscious? So it's, um, you know, whereas my... Actually, it's going to be interesting because my brother's wedding will be on the 7th of May as well. So it'll, it'll, all, be, uh, it'll all be happening, I think, over the next go. couple of weeks. So, uh, but yes, uh, that is another show for us here at the studios of Radio Italiano. Um, don't forget to jump on to our Facebook page and contribute to any comments. Feel free to inbox. Uh, more than happy to respond. Uh, you can also jump on to our YouTube channel and actually start to see us and what we look like in the studios here at uh, of Podcast City and, and Radio Italiano, but also our Spotify channel as well. So uh, we hope you enjoy the show. We will probably see you guys back in about three weeks' time to allow Lee to run the Grand Prix, my brother to get married, and uh, yes, we can share some more jokes and shenanigans and, uh, and motorsport passion for you all. Enjoy your night, guys.